Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today's lecture is going to be understanding the divisions of Assyrian Christianity. And what we will be talking about today is trying to understand not only the Christological divisions within the Assyrian nation, no matter what its identities are, no matter what terminology people use. So we will understand the different Christologies of the Assyrian nation, Christological um, tenets and beliefs. We are going to also talk about the names, different identities and where they came from. We are going to discuss how the corporate nature of these churches has led to the divisions within the larger, call it the Assyrian church. And we're going to talk about the opposition to certain expressions, such as the word Assyrian, from the academic community in part, and we will also discuss within the Assyrian people, the opposition to the use of the word Assyrian in connection with churches and identities and so on. So we've got a lot to talk about, and I hope that you will have questions towards the end. And feel free to send your questions via writing through the chat. I'm sure most of you can, can uh, do that, have done that. So please feel free to do that. And if there is anything that I have not been able to answer during the lecture, please feel free also to communicate with me by email um, or also um, you can let Sarah know if, if it's a question that um, you think may offend me or it's a comment that you may offend me, you may communicate with Sarah. She's more than happy to polish your statement so as I won't be offended as much. But with that, let us begin. So how did we get here? Now, we know that most Assyrians or most Syriacs or most Chaldeans or most Aramaeans, all these terms are used. I use the word Assyrian for historical reasons, for historical accuracy. How did we get here in terms of different churches and different identities? We have something called the Assyrian Church of the East, Holy Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East. The word Catholic in the Assyrian Church of the East does not refer to a union with Rome, with the Catholic Church. We have the Syriac Orthodox Church. We have the Syriac Catholic Church, which is the Catholic version of the Syriac Orthodox Church. We have the Chaldean Catholic Church or the Chaldean Church, which is the Catholic version of the Church of the East. And we have the ancient Church of the East, which was formed in 1968 as a result of some friction within the Church of the East, and we'll talk about that briefly. Now, one thing off the bat I want to let you know is that there are many scholars, and one of them is um, Dr. Uh, Chip Coakley, J.F. Coakley, who is a, a great scholar, um, who is a, a good person, a very kind person, but with whom I completely disagree when it comes to phraseology when it comes to connections with the ancient Assyrians. And he wrote a very good book, The Church of the East, The Assyrian Church of the East and the Church of England. And in this book, he has a footnote where he addresses the term Assyrian as it is used today. And he says, I refer to the link created between the modern Assyrians and always look out for scholars like this. They'll put the word Assyrian in quote marks and the ancient Assyrians. Ancient Assyrians, of course, does not have to have quote marks because those are 
in the eyes of scholars like Mr. Coakley or Dr. Coakley. They are the legitimate Assyrians. In short, the name Assyrian is now inseparable from a whole bogus ethnology. And of course, this type of thinking about the continuity of Assyrian history, and you've heard me talk many times about the importance of understanding Assyrian history through this prism of continuity. The, this issue has many, many critics. This issue of continuity has many, many critics among the academics. But I believe, and we are seeing more and more, that as the pieces are put together through various academic studies, people will begin to see a more comprehensive picture, a more historically accurate picture of true continuity of the Assyrian people from the ancient past all the way into the present. In other words, a continuity of culture, of geography, of demography, of ethnicity, and finally, of identity. Sometimes identity does not reflect what is historically accurate, and we will discuss that. Now, I believe that uh, Dr. Coakley misses some, some important points, and that is because his focus is on Syriac Christianity. He is in love with Syriac Christianity, as many scholars of the history of Syriac studies and Syriac literature and the faith of our forefathers, the Christian faith of our forefathers is. So Dr. Coakley believes that one has to protect and preserve and maintain and even enhance this precious Syriac Christian heritage and that the word Assyrian is somehow infringing on the protection and enhancement of this Syriac heritage, something that is not true because the word modern Assyrian does not only encompass ancient Assyrian, but it also encompasses a period of time of our Christian Assyrian forefathers. So let's take a look at where these divisions come from and where these misunderstandings or misinformation comes from. Let's break it down this way. Among our people are what we refer to as Easterners and Westerners. And oftentimes they are referred to as Eastern Syrians or Syriacs. And at times um, these terms are used as Assyrian, for example. And then we have Western Syrians or Syriacs. And keep in mind the word Syrian and Syriac really are the same word, just as I believe something that is based in history is the word Assyrian and Syrian and Syriac are really the same. They flow together. Uh, the word Syriac did not come from any other word than Syrian, and the word Syrian did not come from any other word than Assyrian. So if the people living in ancient Assyria were being referred to as Syrians, Christian Syrians, and they were speaking the Aramaic language or Syriac language or Assyrian language, just as their forefathers had done, and they had converted to Christianity and believed that they are descendants of the ancient Assyrians, as we see historically Assyrians had done long before the British came, long before contacts with Westerners, then one should view them as the same people, unless there is proof to the contrary. So we're going to take a look today at how our people, the Assyrian people, were divided into various branches and how that came about and how the different terms that are used by our people came about. Again, to understand Syriacs or Syrians is to understand Assyrians and we understand them as being West Syrians and East Syrians or West Syriacs and East Syriacs. Largely, one group is Church of the East originally, and then that becomes, of course, the Assyrian Church of the East, and it becomes also the ancient Church of the East, as well as the Chaldean Church. Those are people we would categorize as Easterners or East Syriacs. On the other hand, we have West Syriacs, 
Those are the Syriac Orthodox and then later Syriac Catholics. Now the dialects, there are dialect differences between the two groupings, but they are not synonymous with one belonging to the Syriac Orthodox Church. So to complicate things, for example, if you go to the Nineveh Plain today and you speak with people, they will be speaking Eastern Syriac, but some of them will belong to the um, Syriac Orthodox Church or to the Syriac Catholic Church and will use as a liturgical language, the Syriac, the Western dialect of, of Syriac or Assyrian. But their native language, their spoken language, um, is going to be Eastern Syriac. So although they belong to a church that is classified as Western, the Western Syrian church or Western Syriac church, in effect, they are really Eastern Syriacs or Eastern Assyrians. And here we have some samples for you to look at. We have Estrangilo, my favorite writing in our language, which is the kind of the title that is used for titles and um, um, uh, signs, for example. And then we have Sorto, which is used in the Western Syriac. And then we have Madin Chaya or Madin Hoyo, which is the Eastern Syriac. So there are basically three types of writing. And, it's, and of course, there are certain exceptions where there is use of combination of these letters. But by and large, today we have the Estrangili, which is used by both Eastern and Western. And then we have the Sorto, which is used by the Western Syriac uh, script. Or, or is the Western Syriac script. And then we have Madan Chaya or Madan Hoyo used by the Eastern Syriacs. And just so you understand the geography, East of course refers to East. Uh, Assyrians from Urmia and Salamis and Soldus and Hakkari and the Nineveh Plain belong to the Eastern Syriac group. And Assyrians living in Tur Abdin and other places more south in Edessa and other places belong to the Western group. And of course, the culture of the Assyrians, the language and heritage spread, and some would say even the Assyrians themselves spread all the way to Lebanon to encompass the Maronite church. We're not going to discuss the Maronite church today only by certain references, because we're largely focused on the geographic situation of the uh, Assyrians. Now, in the early years of the Christian centuries, all the churches vaguely belonged to a loose entity whose hierarch was stationed in Antioch. Antioch was one of the cities, in addition to Rome and Constantinople and Alexandria and Jerusalem. Uh, uh, and um, well, that's it. Uh, the Church of the East wanted to also add to Antioch, but, but that was later. Antioch was considered a center of learning. And this was generally true until the split with Christians living in the Sasanian Empire. I've emphasized in this class repeatedly that we often have Assyrians falling in between various empires and are pressured by two sides, by East and West. This certainly was the situation when the Assyrians of Mesopotamia and Assyrians of later, what later became Syria, uh, fell on two sides of the border in um, major conflicts between the Byzantines and the um, uh, Sasanian empires. First, it was the on the east, it was the Parthians and the Romans, and later it was the Byzantines more accurately, also Romans, but more accurately Byzantines and the Sasanians. Oftentimes these empires are referred to in the east as Persian. I think it's a more accurate way to describe them as either Sasanian or Parthian. They are different types of Iranian groups. They are not all Persian. So generally, there was this discussion of what is God and what is man in Christ. Okay, this was now in Christianity, of course, we have 
the belief that there is God, the Father, but we also have the Son and the Holy Spirit. God encompasses all three without getting into a deep theological or Christological discussion here. You just un have to understand that Christianity believes in the Trinity. That is one of the essences of Christianity. And there were generally two schools of thought that address this. By school of thought, there's been a lot of discussion. What does this mean exactly? Was it an actual school where people were thinking a certain way? Well, it's a group of people getting together and believing, based on the writings that we have today, certain Christological um, tenets. So the school of Antioch and the school of Alexandria generally in belief opposed each other. Alexandria concerned itself more with theology. Antioch emphasized historical data, so the human Jesus. Nestorus, a 5th century Byzantine bishop of Constantinople, adhered to a Christological doctrine that originated in the Antiquian school and developed substantially by two figures, Diodorus of Tarsus and his pupil Theodore of Mopsuestia. And their writings survived to us to this day, survive to this day, and they are believed to be the sort of forefathers of the Christology of the Church of the East. And the actually the term Nostoris doesn't really enter the uh, vocabulary of the Church of the East until something like 612 AD, so much later. So Theodore taught that for the sake of humanity, Jesus suffered as a human, that Jesus had a complete humanity as well as divinity, and that this did not lead to two Christ, but a union of human and divine, an indwelling of the word. Now, these are very complex thoughts, and as I emphasize, it is difficult to believe that people in the ancient past who were fighting either on this side or believing on this side were at conflict with each other over these concepts because even today, with all the knowledge that we have, most people belonging to the Church of the East or the Syriac Orthodox Church, for example, who tend to adhere to different uh, Christological beliefs, probably do not deeply understand these concepts. And this is, of course, this is not to criticize anyone because this is something that people may not be interested in. And just to kind of break it down for you in, in graphs, uh, I, and I symbolize the Church of the East with the photograph of the Patriarch Mar Allah III, who's the head of the Church of the East, the Assyrian Church of the East, and uh, the other one with the um, Patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church, Mar Afram III. Miaphysite and diaphysite are the two beliefs about Christ. One believes that Christ has two natures that are not completely intertwined. Their natures are separate. The human and the God or the human and the divine in Christ are two. That is why in the Church of the East, it is often said, two natures and two essences it's the best translation for those two terms. So there is no mixing. Whereas in the Miaphysite belief, Christ is kind of coming together. The human and the divine are more intermixed. And of course, you see here a, a graph that how Christianity really was when beliefs weren't the main, main issue, it was more practices Christians were more together when it came to breaking down the beliefs of the various people. We see the formation of various uh, churches over time. And we're going to go into how that came about. Council of Nicaea, you've heard of something called the um, Nicene Creed, which is read by all Christians. Um, came about because the uh, church fathers gathered together um, to ward off a movement called Arianism in the 300s AD. 
in Nicaea in 325, uh, prelates came together without the presence of the Christians from what is known as the Persian Empire, established that the son was from the usia, the substance of the father, and the same substance with the father. This countered and abolished the teachings of the priest Arius, who lived in Egypt, who taught that only the father in the Christian trinity was God, and the son was lesser and not of the same substance. As soon as the teachings of Arius were entirely rejected, the query regarding the relationship of the godly nature with the human element in Jesus arose. So that now that we can figure out Christ is the same substance as God, well, what about Christ? What about the son? What is the nature of the son? And of course, um, different views uh, came about. And unfortunately for Nostoros, who was a very, um, one could say difficult character based on the people that knew him and what is written about him, he adhered to his belief. For example, he stressed that Mary cannot be known as Theotokos, mother of God, but Christokos in Greek, which is the mother of Christ. And eventually he was condemned because uh, he had enemies. Now it's hard to believe that everything was really based on this Christological division between people, between Nostoros and his most ardent enemy, which is Kirill of Alexandria. So, uh, and Kirill, by the way, was a very powerful uh, bishop in Alexandria. He was the, uh, one could say, patriarch of Alexandria, uh, got into it with uh, uh, Nostoros and uh, the Church of the East in later traditions considers Kirill to be a very evil man and has various poetry about Kirill uh, denigrating him. And, of course, um, uh, Kirill's tradition passes to the Syriac Orthodox and the Coptic Orthodox and eventually the Armenian Orthodox churches. These are the Miaphysite churches. And Nostoros to them is a heretic. Um, in fact, Nostoros to the Miaphysites is someone who possibly, whose teachings possibly gave rise later to Islam. And that's, of course, um, not true, but it is believed that the lessening of the nature of Christ, which Nostoros has been accused of, not entirely true, of course, but the lessening of the godliness in Christ by Nostoros, or what, in other words, what others say about Nostoros is that he lessened the role of the divine within Christ. And that is associated with later development in Islam, where Christ is seen as somewhat important, but he is a prophet within um, uh, Islam and not a uh, with the same nature as God. So that is an unfair description of Nestorus. It is an unfair portrayal of the Church of the East. In other words, Nestorianism is not the same as what Nestorius taught but he has been mislabeled, lots of misinformation and fake news, as it were, about Nostoros got him into trouble, and eventually he passed away as a man who was um, often referred to, is referred to as Sahdid la Dimma, martyr without blood. He was exiled and died in what is today Libya. And there is a tradition among uh, Coptic Christians that where he died, uh, where he was buried, uh, it does not rain in the desert. So as if God has cursed him. Now, as I said, it's hard to believe that all of these conflicts really came about uh, because um, there were Christological disputes, and these were kind of at the heart of everything. Obviously, these are human beings that we're dealing with that are arguing. So these divisions had a lot to do also with family associations, with different power structures all over the Near East and Europe, with uh, associations of one group versus another, with the maintenance of power, with uh, keeping power, um, with 
conflicts between personalities and and possibly because we have them in writing these um disputes that are that are christological have become really the official reason for the split between various uh groupings but important to keep in mind that although these divisions were happening at this time in no way did this encompass any separate ethnicity on the part of this or that group though people were associated at this time less with nationality than with religious faith so that was the most important thing whether one is a christian belonging to the church of the east or whether one is a christian belonging to the syriac orthodox church or one is an arian one is a heretic one is not a heretic really based not on ethnicity but based on the beliefs or the purported beliefs or the perceived beliefs of people spanning the entire uh, Middle East. And so the Assyrians, because of the power structure, because of the power struggles between the great powers of the Byzantines and the Sasanians, on the other hand, the Assyrians fell into this division and were slowly demographically and geographically being pulled apart. When the Islamic conquest happened, the Assyrians were living in both the Byzantine uh, area and the Sasanian area. And oftentimes Assyrians praised the coming of Islam because of the very difficult circumstances that they were put in under uh, the, both the Byzantines and the Sasanians because of the drawn out conflicts that took a toll on their land and on their people. And the Muslims immediately set about, or the Arabs, incorporating themselves into the empire and incorporating into the new empire and incorporating the native people of the area who were the learned people who were largely the Assyrians in Mesopotamia, particularly the northern part of the country, into their empire. And they served as doctors and, and uh, um artisans and physician, uh, uh, physicians and writers and translators and so on and so forth. Now immediately, as Islamic power grew in the Middle East, um, the, at the time of the Isla Islamic conquest, these divisions within the Assyrian people, and of course, again, we have to think this time in terms of not ethnicity, but various religious groups, the, the Assyrian people were divided. And oftentimes they would complain either to the caliphs in, um, in Islamic times, later Islamic times, or to, um, or to the uh, um, Sasanian rulers or governors. And so we have a, an ex, uh, uh, this is of course before the Islamic conquest, we have a uh, reference to how the Monophysites or the Jacobites, oftentimes they are referred to in very derogatory terms as if they're magicians and they're heretics by members of the Church of the East, and it goes vice versa, of course. Now we, we do not yet have the Chaldean Church, we have the Church of the East and we have the Syriac Orthodox Church, what came to be known as the Syriac Orthodox Church, in conflict with each other. These are the two main groups. The Church of the East is a larger group, and the Syriac Orthodox, largely on the western side, is a smaller group penetrating into what is Sasanian territory. With silver incantations and golden supplications, the Monophysites won the indulgence of the present-day governors, and he'd even gained permission to build a church at the gates of Nineveh in view of the latrines, latrines causing people to groan and be in torment wherever they go to empty their bowls. So it's obviously an insult here against the uh, Jacobites or against the Neophysites, referred to here as Monophysites in this translation, by a, this is a reference to the Syriac Orthodox Church penetrating the area of Nineveh where it had not been before, where the Church of the East had predominated. The Church of the East eventually saw its destruction 
and uh, the Church of the East was, of course, at one time, one of the largest churches in Christendom. It certainly was thought to be, by many writers, larger than the Orthodox and the Catholic churches combined in the West. But eventually, at the time of Timur, Timur Lang, the uh, Church of the East had almost been eradicated. And I'm sorry for the term use of the term Nestorians. Typically, I don't use it, but it is used. Uh, I hope that um, you do not understand my advocacy of uh, this word, but it is used sometimes. In two locations, they survived in the provinces of Assyria, which had retained its name in Christian sources in the districts of Beth Germe, Adiaben, Erbil, Kerch Beth Siluk, Nuhadra, Nineveh, Mosul, etc., where the church had acquired much of its nourishment in the beginning, and in the Hekari Mountains of Ottoman uh, Kurdistan, where the Assyrians lived largely in isolated existence until being evicted by Kurds and Turkish troops or Ottoman troops during the First World War. Additionally, a small number of Indian uh, members of the church, Nestorians, remained faithful to the Malabar district in southern India. And that remains the case to this day. And by the way, this group in India refers to their church as the Chaldean church, and we're going to find out why. But they are members of the Church of the East and under the Assyrian Church of the East. All of the other dioceses in the Church of the East were lost forever. So this was the end of the Church of the East at the um, uh, 12th or 11th century. And it was a slow demise of the church. And by the time that the church had weakened, another split takes place. And that is the Chaldean split. Let's understand what the Chaldean church split means. So the Church of the East continued to lose various communities. In 1551, the Church of the East in community in Tabriz disappeared in Baghdad in 1553. It disappeared in Nasiban in 1556. In Jerusalem in 1616. The church had been there since 1065. As well, Marogan Monastery in Tur ad Din was transferred to the Syrian Syriac Orthodox or Syrian Orthodox from the Church of the East. During this time, the patriarch became a, some people would refer as a tribal prince or a tribal leader. That's the patriarch of the Church of the East, who eventually lived in the Hakkadi area. Now, the secession within the church came about because Marshamun Barmama, who was living in Al Qush at the time, witnessed a, um, with disappointment, the secession of a sizable Assyrian community that signed its own union with the Catholic Church of Rome. The bishops of Erbil, Salamas, and Urmi revolted against Marshamun electing the abbot of the monastery of Rabban Hormis, Mario Hannan Sulaqa, uh, often termed as a reluctant abbot to lead the newly born Unate Church. Unate means Church of the East under the jurisdiction of Rome or under the or in union with Rome. Mario Hannan Sulaqa was established as patriarch in Rome by Pope Julius III after the former presented to the Pope his confession of faith it is often argued that Mario Hanan Sulaqa did not exactly um, do as others accused him of doing, which is basically sell out the Church of the East to the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope proclaimed him Patriarch of the Chaldeans. But also in certain passages, he also pro proclaimed him Patriarch of the Eastern Assyrians and ordained him a bishop of St. Peter Basilica on April 9th, 1553. He returned to his land, Assyria, accompanied by a Roman Catholic delegation, and uh, tried to operate, but was not able to. When he returned, his seat became Diyarbakir. Contrary to what some people think is that Places like Tilkepe and Alqush and Karimlish and other towns in the Nineveh Plain became Chaldean. That is not true. The very first areas were around Mardin, Diyarbakir, and or Diyarbakir is also known as Ahmed. This was the seat of the original um, or the new Chaldean church. 
and he attempted to initiate reforms, but was met with strong opposition from the majority of the people in the Church of the East. He was soon captured by the Pasha of Ahmadiyya, tortured and executed, thrown in the river in 1555. This began the struggle between the two sides. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to stop here and understand where did this word Chaldean come from during this time? And, and what did it refer to? The term Chaldean did not refer to one side versus another. The term Chalde was a, an anachronistic term that was used for people in Mesopotamia. It was also used for the Syriac or Assyrian language. It's a misunderstanding. It's a mislabeling, just like in the Old Testament, we have Ur of the Chaldees. And as you know, of course, based on the lessons that we've learned here, Ur was not a Chaldee or Chaldean, ancient Chaldean city. And we'll make reference to this a little later. But because people writing at the time, which was possibly in the second century BC, possibly even later during Hellenic times, used terminology which really confused both themselves and others, we have today terms like, or phrases like Ur of the Chaldees. Now the term Chaldean or Chaldee did not come to mean the people in the south of Mesopotamia versus the people in the north of Mesopotamia. All of the people eventually used this terminology not because it was opposed to the term Assyrian or even Syriac or even Aramaic, but because it was one additional way to understand. However, we disagree with this term. It was used for all of the Easterners. So the words Assyrian and Chaldean at this time were interchangeable, certainly to the Romans who didn't understand that this was going to be a major big deal later. And of course, when we reflect later, and here I want to bring in Marik Loku of Truma, who refers to this incident, as many Assyrians do, that it was an extremely disappointing uh, time in the history of our people that ripped our nation into two, turned us into one branch Chaldeans and one branch Assyrians. Certainly, this is the view that a lot of people have. But the truth is that that division of ethnicities versus Christological divisions, or if not Christological divisions, denominational divisions, that came much later. And we will again delve into that. Because the, for the Chaldean Bishop Martuma Odu at the turn of the century, who was born in Elkosh in, in the 19th century, um, when he writes the word, Lishana Suriaya or Lishana Suraya, and he translates it in, in French to lingua Chaldean, or in other words, the Chaldean language. He doesn't mean to say Syriac is different than, than uh, Chaldean. He means to say that these are, this is the same language being called with different words. It, it's being referred to with different words. He also, in his very first footnote, tells us that we are, this word suraya or suriaya, comes from asuraya or aturaya, which is Assyrian. We too, he says, the Eastern suraya descend from the Assyrians. We are the children of the Assyrians of, or Ashur. We are the children of Ashur. So his understanding of our ethnicity did not change. If it had changed in the 1500s or later, it certainly would have mattered to people like Martuma Odu to say, for example, well, we understand ourselves as Chaldeans and not as Assyrians, as opposed to Assyrians. But that wasn't the case. And of course, later, we have various uh, members of the Chaldean church saying that the Chaldeans are from the same stock and family as the Assyrians, and their language is one. And this is Yusuf Malik in his uh, book, British Betrayal of the Assyrians. Just one example of people who believe that we are one. And it's very important to understand that one of the most sacred places for the Chaldean church today is Rabban Hurmis Monastery, which is located 
um, in al Qush or in the vicinity of al Qush. And here, I just wanted to show you that nine patriarchs are buried from 1497 to 1804, and that the references in on the graves of the various uh, patriarchs, and here the arrow is pointing to Mar Khnani Shushuman, who died in 1497. The reference is, if you look here, if you know Assyrian, if not, I'm going to read it for you. Tre kiane utre nume, parsupet mshicha. So tre kiane and tre nume means two natures and two essences of Christ. What this tells you is in stone, in the monastery of Rabban Hormis, the patriarchs of the Church of the East are buried adhering to what is called Nestorian or Church of the East Christology. Two natures, two essences of Christ. And that still hasn't changed, even though the church has changed. Well, when did this idea that the Chaldeans are a separate group come in? The personality that I would say is one of the leading uh, people really behind it is uh, Reverend Sarhad Jammu. Reverend Sarhad Jammu of Detroit, initially now of San Diego, California, urged that we are one people and that we know our origins to be Assyrian. Later, he changed that and he urged a separate um, uh, ethnicity or separate identity of Chaldeans and a separate identity for Assyrians and tried to have them parallel to each other, imagining perhaps in the past something like Somar and Ekad, well, why don't we have Assyria and and uh, Chaldea, uh, something that is separate. Well, what Marsar Hajjamu said, of course, was taken uh, a step further, even though initially Mar Emanuel Delhi, who was a patriarch of the Chaldean Catholic Church, the late patriarch prior to um, the coming of Mar Louis Sacco, who is the current patriarch, he said, we Chaldean, Assyrian, and Syrian people, or Syriac people, remember, same terminology, are one people known as the Aramean people. A little bit confusing. He's focused on the language. But what he's really saying is that we are one people. We are one ethnic group. We are one cultural group. We are one demographic group. But then later, at a different gathering, he he says, any Chaldean who calls himself an Assyrian is a traitor, and any Assyrian who calls himself a Chaldean is a traitor. Now, remember when we talked about Christology and, and its divisions, we asked, you know, what could bring this about, these disputes? And oftentimes it has to do with power. So one must recognize the times, one must recognize the context in which Patriarch Mara Manuel Delhi is talking. He is, in essence, really seeking political power. He is believing himself to be the head of the larger church in Iraq or the larger group of Christians in Iraq, and so wants to uh, claim power. And for this reason, he wants to separate himself, separate his adherents from those who use the word Assyrian in order to claim for himself the mantle of leadership. Because if we believe we are one, there are certain people who are leading this oneness, and they are not the people that are associated with me. I would rather uh, obtain that power myself. And this is really um, what is going on here. Of course, one could also say people have uh, dignity and because they are used to certain terminology, they want to continue that terminology, <clears throat> even if it is not sometimes historically accurate. And speaking of historical accuracy, we have various scholars who, based on much research, come to the conclusion that this terminology, Chaldean, contrary to the Bible, one professor of Middle Eastern civilizations tells us, contrary to the Bible, rulers of the Babylonian Empire, Neo-Babylonian Empire, never refer to their subjects or their army as Chaldean. When we turn to terms describing members of the ruling dynasty, we encounter a similar paucity of information. While the biblical evidence has imposed the term Chaldean, remember, 
Ur of the Chaldees. The Neo-Babylonian kings never adopted the designation Chaldean. Not only do we find no ancient claim for the Chaldean origin of the dynasty, meaning that of Nebuchadnezzar, for example, but the term Chaldean does not appear even once in late Babylonian cuneiform documentation. So what does this tell us in terms of historical accuracy? Remember, this is a history class first and foremost. What does this tell us? The term Chaldean did not exist in ancient Mesopotamia. It was not, in other words, a self-designation. And we have Professor Simo Parpola telling us that modern Chaldeans are descendants of Assyria, Assyrians from the heartland of Assyria. There's no other way to look at it. If you are a truthful and honest historian who has seen the evidence. Now, the Chaldean Church of the East, uh, the Chaldean Church um, was very um, unhappy at times, because um, if the Church of the East was going to grow closer to the Catholic Church, well, there was a Church of the East that was Catholic, that was close to the Catholic Church, and that was the Chaldean Church. So when, when His Holiness Mardukha IV set about, Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, set about in 1994 to make amends with the Catholic Church, and issued a proclamation in 1994, um, some members of the Chaldean church felt that they were left out of this negotiation and that they should have first been the ones to be approached and that being of the same background or ethnicity, the church of the East and the Chaldean church should have gotten together before going to the Roman Catholic church. This is one reason why uh, Reverend Sarhad Jammu and later Bishop Sarhad Jammu opposed uh, the Church of the East and became very adamant against it. Well, the Church of the East uh, can be outdone by the Syriac Orthodox Church, and they can split too, of course, and uh, apparently splitting is human nature, uh, and it's very unfortunate for the Assyrian people, but in 1667, with various Catholics lurking around the area, the Syriac Orthodox Church also broke apart. And depending on the time, the Ottomans persecuted and sometimes assisted the uh, Syriac Catholics because of their relationship with Western powers. If their relationship was good at the time, the Ottomans left the Syriac Catholics alone. If it was not good, they would be persecuted. But this began a split, which later, of course, turned into what we know today as the Syriac Catholic Church. And the Syriac Catholic Church today has adherents in Lebanon, in um, Syria, and in Iraq. In fact, one of the largest towns in the Nineveh Plain, which is Eastern Syriac speaking, is Syriac Catholic, and that is Qaraqosh or Baghdad. Their dialect is Eastern Syriac, in other words, they speak very close to people in the Nineveh Plain and, or to Tilkepe and al um, mutually intelligible, and people in Hakkari and even Urmi, but they are separate from the Western Syriacs. However, they belong to the Syriac Orthodox slash Catholic tradition and use in liturgical language the Western alphabet. We have many people in, especially early on, within the Syriac Orthodox tradition that admit to their Assyrian heritage, that advocate their Assyrian heritage. Among them was, was Ashur Yusuf, a very prominent nationalist who became a victim of the Ottoman purges uh, or of the Ottoman genocide of the Assyrian people. But he said very clearly that the advancement of the Assyrian people was not so much um, that, that the hindrance to the advancement was not so much the attacks from without as it was from within, doctrinal and sectarian disputes and struggles like the Monophysites, one nature of Christ versus Diophysites, meaning Syriac Orthodox Church versus the uh, Church of the East is a good example. These caused division spiritually and nationally among the people who quarreled among themselves, even to the point of shedding blood. To this very date, the Assyrians are still known 
by various names, such as Nestorians, Jacobite, Chaldeans. So he was an Assyrian nationalist at the turn of the century, was associated with Protestants, and rejected the denominationalism which caused his people to be divided. And initially in the United States, particularly in the United States, the Syriac Orthodox Church took a lot of pride in using the term Assyrian. So here we see some memorabilia from the Syriac Orthodox Church on the east coast of the United States. And uh, clearly it says Assyrian Patriarch of Antioch or the uh, because it recognizes the word Syriac comes from the word Assyrian. And this is um, particularly the case of St. Mary's Assyrian Orthodox Church in New Jersey, which to this day has retained its name as the Assyrian Orthodox Church rather than the Syriac Orthodox Church. And that, of course, is a dispute within the church. Now, Opposed to this association of Syriac with Assyrian are people who run the World Council of Aramaeans, which is a small group headed by a very um, capable person, I think, um, although wrong, uh, but a capable person in the, um, by the name of Johnny Meso. Johnny Meso is a writer. He's a, an academic, partially. And he advocates the use of the term Aramaean rather than any other term. Um, Aramaean equals Syriac. Um, Syriac does not equal Assyrian. And so there is a dispute um, because the World Council of Aramaeans does not believe that the Assyrian word, the word Assyrian really belongs to our people. And then th this is a misnomer. And he has made the point that for more than a hundred years, um, intellectuals dreamed of an Assyrian nation and a new Assyrian. This elite formulated the political idea of Assyrianism in 1917 and introduced ways to make both Assyrians and the Assyrian language. In other words, created the existence of modern Assyrians, again in quote marks, therefore can be better understood by imagining how the following slogan, uh, by imagining just as easily could have come from the pen of the architects of the Assyrian nation, a nationalist movement who said, we have made Assyria, now we have to make Assyrians. In other words, it is all a fabrication. Just as Coakley, Dr. Coakley said, it is a bogus ethnicity. That is the position of people like Johnny Meso. Well, when we talk about the term Aramaean, again, we're in a history class and we have to learn about the historical accuracy of terms. So it's important to know that archeologists, Assyriologists, those who look very carefully with much scrutiny at history come to the conclusion that, for example, Dr. Uh, Dominique Bonatz has come. The ruling classes in the so-called Aramaean kingdoms of Assyria never refer to themselves as Aramaeans. As an ethnic term, Aramaean is a foreign construct generated from Assyrian, biblical, and only a few so local sources. So in other words, this idea of Aramaean culture or Aramaean ethnicity versus Assyrian ethnicity never actually existed in the past. In other words, there is no historical record of it. Now, we've often said, and, and some of you have quoted back to me, um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That is true. But we do not have to this day, based on all of the archeological excavations that we have made in what is today Syria and Mesopotamia or Iraq, we do not have evidence of something called Aramaean people. There are references in the Bible, just as there are references to Chaldeans in the Bible. But the truth is that whereas Assyrian ethnicity is attested to very clearly in historical and in archeological evidence, the same is not true of the word Aramaean and the word Chaldean. Now, just so we're clear, most careful scholars link the word Syriac and Suraya or Suroyo to the word Ashuraya or Asuroyo. And this is what a very renowned Assyriologist by the name of Simo Porpola tells us. The word Ashurayu, Assyrian, 
had a variant Surayu in the late Assyrian times. The phonology of Suraya, Suroyo, implies that this term, which is crucial to the identity of the present day Aramaic speaking peoples, is an indigenous self designation which the Aramaic speaking Assyrians shared with their Akkadian speaking fellow citizens. In other words, there is no question that this word derives from the word Assyrian. Now, the Church of the East itself, or the Assyrian Church of the East, split, but it split at a time in 1968 when the ethnicity of our people was well established. By 1968, things had fallen into place. The age of nationalism was uh, in full swing, as it were. So people would not change their ethnicity if they changed their churches. And the Church of the East split into two uh, groupings. And this largely was the result of a succession dispute within the patriarchal family. Marti Matius um, was in, in conflict with uh, the Marshamun family. This is the very beginning of this dispute. Um, and we hear from uh, a biography uh, written by Mar'aprim, the Lady Surma, aunt of the patriarch, and Yosef Nanishu, maternal uncle of the patriarch, took a stand against Marti Matius, who was a metropolitan in the church, and argued that Marti Matius was not the region to the patriarch. Wigram tried to bring them together, but attempts failed. Later, Marti Matius agreed to the consecration of the young patriarch, Mar Ishe Shimon, who became patriarch at age 12. But this dispute lingered. And it lingered until 1968, when there was a split within the church. And the new church became headed by the Church of the East, which was called later the Ancient Church of the East, became headed by Martu Madarmu, who was patriarch for approximately a year. Uh, Martu Madarmu was in a dispute with Marshamun, and his dispute led to the splitting of the church. Again, this was not a Christological or a philosophical division. It was a division really having to do with power. And it was further helped along, as it were, by the Ba'athist regime in Iraq. Marade uh, Giwergis followed um, Martu Madarmu after his death and became the Church of the East head, ancient Church of the East head, until 2022. Of course, Mar Ishe Shimon, who was um, a very passionate character, a very strong character, was very upset by the split of the church. And uh, despite attempts to bring back the church together, all attempts failed. Marshamun was assassinated in 1975 on November 6, and in 1976, the patriarch Mardin Khadafur followed. He was the first one to officially apply the word Assyrian to the Church of the East. From this time, it became the Assyrian Church of the East officially. This is not to say he was the inventor of the word Assyrian. As you know, the Syriac Orthodox Church also at times used the word Assyrian and members of the Chaldean church also believed in the term Assyrian, but this was the first time it was applied officially to the Church of the East. Mar Ignatius Zaka Iwas was the head of the Syriac Orthodox Church. His name, very interestingly, was Sancharib or Sanchiru, Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. His death brought about the present day patriarch, Mar Afram the second, I earlier said the third, I meant the second, who is the current head of the church and who is doing his best to kind of bring people back together and try to lessen the tension between the churches and say that we are all really of the same heritage. Now, in part, these divisions come about because there are people like who are nationalistic, who insist on the word Aturaya instead of the word Suraya rather than perhaps finding a solution of uh, grouping them together. So Freydun Aturaya was one of the people, he even, his name was Freydun Bet Oraham, but he's known as Freydun Aturaya. And he is one of the 
first nationalists who was very upset about the lack of nationalism within the Assyrian nation and advocated for it. And this, in, a, in effect, although it's not fair to blame him for this, triggered a kind of a conflict within the church, uh, within the larger Assyrian nation, based on affiliation of different churches. Freydun was, Dr. Freydun was not a member of the Church of the East. He was, grew up a Protestant. And in fact, he was opposed by members of the Church of the East uh, for his um, very passionate nationalism. Another friend of Freydun Aturaya was Binyamin Arsanis, who wrote, if we write truthfully, we as a nation are nothing. We do not even possess a name. We very much resemble the inhabitants of the forest existing without pondering our identity. So Fre uh, uh, Binyamin Arsanis and Freydun Aturaya, along with Hakim Baba Parhat, founded the very first Assyrian political party in Urmia prior to the First World War, and were advocating a deeper understanding of Assyrian nationalism. Unfortunately, the way it turned out was that this Assyrian nationalism was largely adhered to by members of the Church of the East and specifically people from Urmia and Hekari rather than everyone else. That is the situation today. But as we said, the term Assyrian really belongs to all of the groups that we described regardless of the Christology one adheres to or the denomination one belongs to. One's being an Assyrian is a synthesis of heritage, religion, and culture, and emotional consciousness that transcends all diversities, theological, demographic, and otherwise. To be an Assyrian is to feel the past is my heritage. I shall not forget it. The present, my responsibility. The future, my challenge. This is David Purley, a prominent Assyrian attorney in the United States who belonged to the Syriac Orthodox Church. And we have to remember the martyr Marpolis Faraj Raho, because he also, although did not specifically use the word Assyrian, um, stated in very clear terms, let everyone know that Iraq is our land, we are staying here despite all of the persecution endured by our forefathers, we will remain here and we will never leave. What he was saying is that we belong to this land, this land's ruins, architecture, ancient cities, ancient churches belong to us. And of course, he is talking about Northern Mesopotamia. He is talking about Assyria. He was killed in Iraq. The good news is that after all of these Christological divisions, all of these denominational disputes, that the church leadership is coming back together. And hopefully, even if the churches do not come back together officially, there will be more cooperation, more understanding in the future. And I want to end it on this positive note and give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, What's the original name of the Syriac Orthodox Church when it was established under the Byzantine? Was not Yohannes Sulaqa also Marshamun the Eighth? He became Marshamun. Um, Daniel, you are correct. The Syriac Orthodox Church, uh, of course, changed over time. Syriac Orthodox uh, Church, Syriac Orthodox uh, Church of Antioch, Assyrian Orthodox Church at different times. But really, um, it, it has been the same church. So there is no difference in terms of its Christology. There is no difference in terms of its understanding of its heritage. The Aramaic language or the Syriac language continues to be uh, the center of uh, the church, in addition, of course, to its Christology. And that has not changed. You think that the Catholic Church has imposed their views on Assyrian Christianity? If so, thoughts? on the impact possible segregation within the Assyrian culture. I don't quite understand the question. Do I think the Catholic Church has imposed their views on Assyrian Christianity? Well, the Catholic Church is interested in Christology and adherence to belief. Um, 
and, uh, and, and I don't think it's really interested in uh, ethnicity, um, unless your question is, is uh, about, if you, if you specify a little more of the question, perhaps I can address it. What's the official Christology of the Chaldean church? Do they follow the essences and natures of, no, they do not follow um, Nestorian, uh, I don't wanna say Nestorian, Church of the East, Christology, they follow the Catholic, which is more of a blending of the natures of the human and the divine. Um, it's in between the Miaphysite and the Diaphysite churches, Chalcedonian, oftentimes it's referred to. Nahran, are the Indians that belong to the Church of the East Chaldean Church Assyrian, or are they Assyrians that converted to Christianity by the church missionaries? They are not Assyrian, they are Indian. Uh, and the, the terminology they use, and I'm sorry I didn't address this, but I, I referred to it, because at the time that the word Chaldean was used for our people by Rome, the term Chaldean stuck to the people who were part of the Church of the East who happened to be of Indian ethnicity. They are not Assyrian, um, they are natives to uh, Kerala, they speak Malayalam, they don't speak, uh, their native language is not Assyrian, uh, but they are of the Assyrian Church of the East heritage, or if you want to choose the word Chaldean heritage, uh, or Syriac heritage. How did the Muslim invaders treat Christian Assyrians? Of course, that's a very complicated question. And I am going to uh, address it in a different class. But of course, you know, initially, some Assyrians thought that the coming of the Arab invasion was a blessing and wrote so because of the wars between the Byzantines and the uh, Sasanians cost the Assyrians so much uh, bloodshed and hardship. Later on, uh, especially during the Abbasids, when the Islamic culture and faith develops into what it is, um, to what we understand today, a more exclusive religion, um, the situation changes. Certainly, over time, Islam, because of its rules and regulations, uh, causes the diminishment uh, and eventually disappearance of Christianity from various places. And we will get into that in future classes. Was the Chaldean church originally called Church of Assyria and Mosul? Yes, this terminology, uh, Alvin, was used, um, you know, terms like Assyrian and Chaldean were used synonymously. Now, you know, terminology, and, and I, if I can analogize, whether we call someone African American or Black American or Black, um, or the word Negro, we're talking about the same people, in effect. I, I don't mean to use derogatory words here. But we, the word Black and African American refers to the same people. So it's as if uh, a certain group were to say, well, we are Black and they are African American, and we're opposing each other. Um, the word Chaldean was used by outsiders for all of our people, regardless of whether one was Catholic or not. Now, it didn't stick to everyone, but it was used. And initially, the word Assyrian was used. So if you were to ask a person, for example, what you are, he would say Suraya, whether he was in the Nineveh Plain or in Diyarbakir or in Urmi. What did that mean? That eventually meant Assyrian. But things changed. And the word Suraya came to represent, for some Assyrians, simply Christian. And the word Keldaya represented a, an identity that is separate from the word Assyrian. What do you think um, we could not come together as one in the ancient Church of the East? Why do you think we could not come together as one in the ancient Church of the East? I'm sorry, I misread your question. Again, I, I think that uh, part of the problem is really the concrete rather than the theoretical. Uh, people are interested in, you know, um, human relationships, uh, power, money, properties, and so on. And so I think more than anything, um, 
probably this is the reason that uh, people could not come together. I posed it in an article as a challenge for the Church of the East uh, in the latest round um, to the uh, members of the Assyrian Church of the East and the ancient Church of the East. And unfortunately, uh, they were not able to come together, but that doesn't mean it's the end. Uh, I think there ought to be continued attempts to try to um, come together, at least have an understanding. It doesn't mean everyone has to belong to the same exact structure. Daniel asks, does this suggest that the Aramean Palestinian Christians can be referred to as Assyrian? No, now, you know, um, the Palestinians have their own identity, of course. Um, and, uh, and this word Aramean has its own history. And I'm going to discuss how uh, the Israeli government is taking an interest in using this word Aramean as an ethnicity, having recognized it, and uh, how it's sort of stirring a um, difference within the larger Palestinian community. Uh, but that's for a later class. But I, I am not referring to Palestinian Christians as Assyrian. If the first Chaldean patriarch was brutally murdered, how did the new church uh, persevere and grow uh, to the large church? Was it because of missionary activity mainly? Uh, no, I mean, um, you know, the eventually, because there was a conflict within the church of the East, adherence to the Chaldean church eventually grew. And, uh, and this happened drastically after the First World War, during the First World War, when I would say the numbers were something like two-thirds uh, Church of the East, one-third Chaldean, and eventually it became what it is today, something like five to ten percent Church of the East, and the rest, uh, or, or the rest are mixed, but the Chaldean Church is much larger today. Why? Because many people converted um, you know, there was assistance being given by, by various uh, Catholic charities, and eventually people converted, some were paid to convert, some believed in the Catholic Church, I am sure, and uh, that ha had a, um, a slow effect, but eventually the tide was turned, and what originally was a small part of the Church of the East, uh, Uniate uh, Church of the East, eventually became the larger part of the Church of the East. Are Jacobites and Maronites Assyrians? Okay, so a Maronite and Jacobite are, well, I would say Jacobites, if you are talking about West Syriac people or members of the Syriac Orthodox Church largely. And by the way, I don't mean to um, say that every single Assyrian belongs to these particular churches, but we are derived as a people from these churches. And now some of us may be Protestant, some are evangelical, some are non-believing. They could be agnostics or atheists, but they all come from these churches. Now, when you ask about Jacobites, you're talking about a belief, you're talking about a church, a denomination, and Maronites. So um, I would say, yes, uh, largely Jacobites and even many Maronites are probably originally Assyrian or come from Assyrian territory. And there are studies to show that. Now, what their identity is today, you know, some Maronites believe they are Arabs. Some Maronites believe they are Phoenicians. Some Maronites accept that they are Assyrian. What is the Christology of the Syriac Orthodox Church? Assuming the same as the Chaldean Church, since they are both unite. Uh, no, actually, uh, why are they kept separate? The Syriac Orthodox Church is Miaphysite. It does not have the same Christology as the Catholic Church, and not certainly not the same as the Chaldean Church. Roxanne, I understand that this context Chaldean doesn't refer to the people in southern Mesopotamia. Can you please explain once again where the term Chaldean came from when the Pope proclaimed Sulaqa the first patriarch? Why did they use this word in particular? Well, um, because the word Keldi was simply a synonym for the word Syriac, for the word Aramaean. So instead of using the word Aramaic, Keldi also came to be used. And this has a long history. 
And it is a, also a biblical term. Uh, remember, you know, in Rome in the 1500s and 1400s and 1300s, this word, when it was being used, originally referred to people in Mesopotamia, there was no distinguishing. You know, when, when the reference is made to Ur of the Chaldees, it is definitely not accurate. Ur was not a Chaldean or Chaldee town. Ur was a Sumerian town, but the Bible, the Old Testament, has it wrong when it refers to Ur of the Chaldees. So this confusion was later used by the Roman Catholic Church to proclaim our people as Chaldeans. In fact, um, one bishop of Urmia, when an American is engaging in a discussion with him, this is in the 1800s, late 1800s, I believe, he asks him to stop calling him an historian, and the American um, pastor asks, what do you want me to call you if not an historian? He says, call me a Chaldean. Now, why does he say that? Well, certainly he doesn't understand the word Chaldean to be opposite of the word Assyrian or different from the word Assyrian, but that's a term that he believes the Westerners use for our people. So really, it was a misnomer that came to be used, but certainly our people used it, and they mean by it, Easterners, people living in Mesopotamia. Liliana, would it be wrong to say that we speak Aramaic? No, I don't think it's wrong to say that. Many so-called Aramaeans say that as we speak Aramaic or maybe Neo-Aramaic, we are Aramaeans. Well, you know, by that uh, definition, then the Irish are really English and the Haitians are really French. So first of all, we cannot say that because we speak Aramaic or because we speak Syriac and, the, and our language has different terminology, including Assyrian, it's not automatic that we are uh, the language that we use, but this was the language that the ancient Assyrians used. As I referred to the passage from Seymour Parpola, we became Aramaic-speaking Assyrians. Some would say we became Assyrian-speaking Assyrians because the word Aramaic is sometimes called Assyrian. In fact, I've referred to how the rabbis use the word Kitav Ashuri, for their script, which is thought to be Aramaic. So this script of Aramaic and this language was really developed by the Assyrian Empire and spread all over the, the Near East. And if there is anyone to take credit for this language, it should be really the Assyrians. So if it's simply a, um, a um, reference to a language, I would say you can make the argument that it is just as uh, Assyrian as it is Aramaic. We don't have a land and we only have language and culture to define us, then we are Aramaeans. How would you respond to that? Um, no, we do have a land. Uh, we, as the Assyrian people, have a land that clearly was delineated as Assyria, a heartland, uh, which is largely North Iraq, Southeastern Turkey, even parts of Iran and Syria. That was um, the land of Assyria. And, and uh, even though it is not politically the land of Assyria, that clearly continues to be the Assyrian land, even though there are different. Uh, in other words, no one has the right to say that there are no Assyrians because they do not have political power. That would wipe away many people on this earth. Were some uh, Chaldean church leaders killed because of their announcement of Assyrian name and who they truly were? Um, I would say I, I, you'd have to give me um, an example. I'm not sure. You know, there, there are people who, and we have to look into this a little more, who were trying to bring the Church of the East and the Chaldean Church together at one point. And uh, such as uh, Ogin Menna, Mara Ogin Menna, who is um, the author of the Great Dictionary. And it is thought that um, behind his killing was uh, the, uh, the Latin church. Uh, but, but there is no verification of this. Are Arab Christians Assyrian? Well, no, there are Arab Christians, you know, living in various places. 
and uh, they are not <clears throat> automatically Assyrian. But some who are calling themselves Arab Christians, for example, living in the area of Nineveh, belonging to certain uh, Assyrian uh, uh, circles or, or Assyrian denominations, such as the Syriac Orthodox Church, for example, they may refer to themselves as Arab Christians, and they may speak our language, but they, because of the indoctrination of, in particular, the Baathists in Iraq, could be calling themselves uh, Arab Christians, but of course this would be inaccurate. Can you recommend some books for us uh, to better understand the various Christology, Christologies and histories of our uh, various churches? Yes, I would be happy to, and I will email those to you. Alfred, can you also refer to Jacobites and Maronites as part of the Assyrian church? Yes, absolutely. I would say Jacobites and Maronites are part of Assyrian culture. And, and remember, I'm not a big fan of just saying we are genetically Assyrian. Certainly, we have within us, just like all people have, different genetic material, and that is just something that happens to all civilized people. But we are a coherent and um, uh, comprehensive culture and people, and we are called the Assyrians, and the word Suraya or Syriac or Suryoyo is a part of that heritage. Is there a truth behind Marco Polo meeting the and interacting with Assyrian missionaries in 700 AD? Yes, Marco Polo met with people from the East. He doesn't use the word Assyrian, but he certainly met with missionaries. And um, when he met the Mongols, he certainly saw that there was a great deal of respect um, for the Church of the East among the Mongols. Mark, why do we consider Freydun Atorai an important figure to understand our identity as Assyrian? when we discuss the concept of Assyrian continuity, is Assyrian identity in more of a secular sense significant? Why? Good question. Freydun Aturaya came at the age of, at the initiation of the age of nationalism for the Assyrians, and he advocated a strong sense of ethnicity above denominational differences. So for that reason, Freydun Aturaya was referred to as you know, his name, original name is Bet Oraham, but he's referred to as Aturaya for the reason that he advocated a strong sense of Assyrian nationalism. And he certainly advocated a secular uh, nationalism <clears throat> more than uh, denominationalism. Since Elvin, since Shar, king of Assyria, was technically also high priest of Ashur, would it be that the current mentality of the Assyrians stems from their long history of the priestly uh, class ruling over them? Very interesting question. I would say, yes, there was no separation in the past between the priestly class and the ruling class. And that, you know, they certainly were one and the same in the Assyrian kingdom. The Assyrian king was the high priest of Ashur. So there might be that. There's certainly a lot to um, the charisma uh, given off by many church leaders. And of course, this is changing, you know, in an age of secularism and, and westernization, a lot of this is changing. But we'll leave that for another class. Tony asks, how do you think we pave the way for future unification, despite the colossal roadblocks? Well, that's a good question. And I, I'm afraid I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I probably, um, well, I'll probably have a lot to say maybe in the future, Tony. But thank you for the question. Um, I think it's going to take a lot. Um, and um, and I, I'm not sure I can answer it within a short uh, period of time, but uh, thanks for that question. It's a good question. Uh, Dennis, why, do we, why have we always depended on churches to unite us when the Assyrian, um, when Assyrian is not, Assyrianism is not a religion, I guess. Can't we unite as Assyrians, even if our churches don't? Well, that was a good question, Dennis, because that's exactly what Freydun Aturaya and Binyamin Arsanis and Ashur Yusuf and Naum Fayyak and all these great Assyrian nationalists advocated that the ethnicity is separate. But people being people, 
um, you know, they tend to adhere to their denominations. And as one member of a Syriac Orthodox Church said to another, uh, I remember in my presence, he said, do you know why I am not an Assyrian? And because the other one believed that he was an Assyrian, this particular member did not. He said, because Assyrians do not believe that Christ is, that Jesus was God. And so in his mind, the word Assyrian really equated with the Church of the East. And he wouldn't mind saying I'm Church of the East, as long as the Church of the East believes that Jesus was God. And so here we have an understanding of ethnicity that is different than than the way you uh, view it and, and I view it. But the person is entitled to his beliefs. Daniel, did the Samana massacre encourage Chaldeans, Aramaeans to identify his names in order to get away from the Assyrian reputation to protect themselves? We make this argument, certainly, uh, because there is a, uh, a tract, Daniel, uh, uh, by a member of the Syriac Orthodox Church that advocates a distancing from the word Assyrian because he says, well, look what happened to them in Semele. They trusted the British. Look what happened to them. So let's get away from this word. Let's disassociate from this people because this word is trouble. Daniel, did the Chaldeans return to their mother church after the killing of Yohanna Sulaqa? Well, some may have. Uh, we just don't know uh, how many went back and how many were afraid, for example. Um, but, but we do know that the church eventually grew, especially after the First World War, when, you know, bishops and priests and churches of the Church of the East were destroyed in the Hakkari area and Urmia, and the people were dispossessed, and the people who happened to belong to the Chaldean church largely maintained their villages. Uh, that certainly changed the equation, and many of our people became members of the Chaldean church. Um, from the Church of the East. Alvin, speaking of Ogun Mena, since he might have been assassinated, is that why his extensive writings never saw the day, light of day? He wrote quite a lot, but very little is published. That could be. That could be. Why was Mario Hanan Sulaqa assassinated? Mario Hanan Sulaqa was assassinated because he went against his church in the belief of the current ruling class of the Church of the East at the time. And he had betrayed, according to the beliefs of, of, um, of the uh, patriarch in charge at the time, he had betrayed um, his beliefs, he had betrayed the church to Rome, and that was enough to have him killed. He was also, of course, a challenge to the power of the patriarch who maintained his seat, and Mario Hanna Sulaqa was challenging that. Okay, I believe I have answered to the best of my abilities. I hope I made things clear. As one of my teachers used to say, as clear as mud. I hope I made things clear to you about the divisions, and I hope we cleared up a little of the identity issue. We will certainly touch on this topic more in the future. And we are going to understand how Assyrian nationalism came about, what were the challenges, what was Freydun Aturaya really trying to accomplish at the turn of the century, what were the early nationalists uh, trying to accomplish, and um, eventually what happened to them, what happened to their cause, what happened to their case. How did it turn out? Thank you very much, um, Dr. John and Nahran. Thank you. God bless you all. I really appreciate you being here. And if you want to watch these videos afterwards, of course, you're more than welcome. You go to YouTube, check out the page of the Assyrian Cultural Foundation, and you will find many of these videos there. Thank you again, and have a wonderful night. And I will see you next time when we discuss uh, Marti Matius and what a great patriarch he was and how the Church of the East fared under Islamic rule.